I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and Director of this Mental Health Expert Series. I'm really delighted to be here today as Dr. Lori Santos, a Professor of Psychology and Head of Silliman College at Yale University about her work on the science of happiness. So thanks for being here today, Lori. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I was wondering if we could start out just by hearing a bit about the work you're doing in the science of happiness and wellness. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny, as you know, June, well, my day job is actually doing work on comparative cognition, so studying how animals think about the world, but I've kind of jumped into this different field looking at the mental health and the science of happiness. Um, it started in kind of a funny way. I was, uh, I've was i been a professor teaching at Yale for over a decade, but recently I took on this new role as a head of college where I like live and hang out with students on campus, right? And it was in this capacity that I really saw like how bad college student mental health is in the trenches, just like tremendous amounts of depression, anxiety, just incredible stress. And, you know, even at the non-clinical levels, just students who are just fast forwarding everything because they were just so stressed. They just like wanted to get to the weekend or get to spring break and so on. And it made me realize that students just needed some really practical tips about how to do better, right? Like how to live in ways that would allow them to like flourish more and not feel so stressed. And so I kind of dove into the science of well-being in order to teach a new class on Yale's campus. Um, I christened it Psychology in the Good Life. Uh, and, you know, assume like it was a new class, so, like 30 students or so would take it, you know, like a new, like kind of upper level class. Um, was kind of shocked when over a quarter of the Yale population decided to take the class. Um, we wound up having over a thousand students, which was a little surreal and a bit of a logistical nightmare, but you don't need to get to that. Um, but, but yeah, it really taught me that, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks out there who really want some evidence-based tips for what they can do to feel better, right? And I think that that's really important. And one of the reasons I was so excited to do this series is that I think as scientists, we, we have this advice that can be really helpful for people, but we're not often out there, you know, putting it out there in ways that folks can actually really understand what they need to do and kind of get it in digestible forms. And so uh, even though my research isn't necessarily on mental health, I've started getting really into sort of thinking about how we can kind of share the science of well-being really broadly. And then on that note, um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about just the really amazing ways you've been sharing the science of wellness through your course and your podcast. Um, just say a little bit about them because they're amazing. Yeah, so each of the cases were kind of, you know, not intended and a little surreal. So, you know, I decided to teach this live class on Yale's campus, which went totally viral. Um, and, and not just on campus, but somehow there was a lot of press about the class, which was interesting. I think the the, the take from the press was kind of like, you know, these Yale students who are 19 and are at an Ivy League institution and have their whole lives ahead of them are so, you know, messed up that they need a class on happiness. Like, what about the rest of us? You know, it's sort of the, the general the kind of framework. And so then what happened was we realized that I just got tons of emails from people, honestly, around the world who are saying, can you share this stuff? You know, I need to know more about this. And that led us to do the first thing we did, which is to put the class online. Um, so on Coursera.org, we put a class up called the Science of Wellbeing. It's kind of just like a short version of the Yale class, um, kind of like a little Coursera sized version of the Yale class. Um, and that now has over 3 million learners who've taken it, which is really cool. Um, but then I got emails from a different group of people who said, you know, I'm really stressed and overwhelmed. I don't have time for a whole Yale class. Like, you know, give me something that's like, you know, way shorter than that and way less stressful than that. And so that was why we started my new podcast, which is called The Happiness Lab. Um, it's a kind of podcast version of a lot of the tips that I teach in the Yale class. But the podcast version is cool because it allows me to share all these narrative stories about how people are putting the science into practice in their own lives. And I can talk with really cool folks. And so it's been kind of a blast. And I mean, along the way, as you've been doing all this work, what have been some notable both, you know, frustrations and challenges, but also some successes you've really savored? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the, I guess I'll start with the frustrations. I think some of the frustrations is like, you know, I'm in this position of sort of popularizing some of the work in positive psychology and in, in mental health generally. And one of the big frustrations are spots where, you know, people really want some advice, but the field isn't really there yet in terms of answers for these problems. And just to kind of give one example, you know, I'm constantly asked, okay, like, thank you for these tips. Now, how do I get myself to do them? Right? Like, I know what I'm supposed to do, but how do I put that into action? And I think this is something that we as, the, as a field don't really know yet. I mean, we know a little bit about how you can nudge behavior and how you can you know, develop habits and stick to them, but that disconnect between knowledge and our intentions and our behavior is a big one. And I think we don't have any answers yet. So I think that would be the biggest frustration is spots where you know, people, my listeners to the podcast and learners are like, okay, great scientists, like tell me how to do X. 
And I'm like, we as scientists don't really know how to figure out X yet. So that's, that's a frustration. But, um, but on the things to savor and the things I'm grateful for, I mean, it's just been so amazing that these kinds of like different mechanisms can reach so many people. I mean, we've had over 20 million unique downloads for the Happiness Lab. And, you know, I just get letters all the time from folks that it's helping. I think that's just been really humbling because, again, it suggests we have some of the scientific answers. We just need to do a better job of sharing them. And I mean, that really makes me think of a question that you're alluding to, which is, you know, where do we go from here? How do you take the work that you're doing and sharing the science of wellness and happiness broadly? Like, how, how can we expand that as we look into the horizon? Yeah, well, I realized in this funny way, just because we'd gotten so much press on the course, I had this kind of odd responsibility, you know, and that's why I started out with what my day job is. You know, again, I'm not a clinical psychologist or even a positive psychologist by training. I'm a psychologist and I know this stuff, but, you know, I've had to like re like figure out my field and like learn a ton of stuff, right? Even in my like, you know, academic age being a tenured professor, um, it took a lot of like relearning to be able to teach this stuff. But I sort of felt like I had a responsibility to do it because, you know, I had so many like folks in the press looking out for me and people saying I should, you know, I had this platform that I didn't necessarily intend, but there it was. And it was like, okay, I could actually do some good with this platform. Um, but my goal was really to like pivot to the actual scientists that do this work. And that's what's been so fun about the podcast is that, you know, it doesn't have to be me saying, you know, this is what X, Y, and Z study showed. I can get that scientist themselves and then, then give them a platform where they can reach millions of people too. And so I think, I guess the advice would be, you know, as scientists, we should be using whatever platforms we have. And one great thing about the modern era is that, you know, access is really democratic. You know, anybody can create a YouTube channel and, you know, email a faculty member and try to see if they will do an interview. You know, pretty much anyone can create a podcast if you just have a phone that can record audio. And that means that we really can be like sharing our message much more broadly. There's so many more mechanisms to do this than there were even just 10 years ago. And so I think as scientists, you know, who get grant funding and, you know, the people are paying us to do our work, I think we got to reach back out more than we often do. So then, of the final question I had for you, Laurie, was just what advice would you have for people who are watching this interview today? Maybe it's students, maybe it's the public um, who want to get more engaged, who want to get more engaged in the work you're doing, and maybe themselves want to think about ways they can share some of these findings more broadly. Yeah, well, I guess that, you know, the practical side would be like, check out the Happiness Lab, you can definitely <laughs> anywhere you get your podcasts, you know, or check out the Coursera.org class, The Science of Wellbeing. Um, but in terms of how you can, you know, use the science of well-being to your advantage, I really feel like this is a domain where understanding the science is your first step, right? And, and the reason, as I talk about often in the podcast, is that, you know, the data really suggests our minds lie to us about the types of stuff that make us happy, right? Like, there's all this stuff that we seek out. There's all these things that we go for, whether that's, like, money or accolades or, like, you know, like, the next click on a social media thing. And it, those things can sometimes increase happiness in the very short term, or they can give us a little dopamine hit, but they're not sustaining and they can lead to all these problems. But they're a case where our intuitions are wrong. And so I think the first step you can do is to really learn more about the kinds of things that really do promote well being, that really do count as self care, that really do protect your mental health. And the striking thing is they're often not what you think. But once you learn what they are, you know, then the, the task is clear. It's like, this is the kind of stuff you should be prioritizing and putting into your life. Well, Lori, thanks so much for speaking today. This was really wonderful as always. Cool. Thanks so much for having me.